Welcome back to Light the Fuse. Charles, how you feeling? I feel good. How do you feel? I feel good. I feel good. I feel I feel like we have a bunch of kick-ass shows lined up, including the one you're about to hear. Yes. So I'm feeling I'm feeling hyped up about that, if I'm being totally honest. Yes. I think we both love Bilga so much. Yes. You've known him for a long time. How did you meet him? Yeah, I met him through my friend Josh Rothkopf, who was the critic for Time Out. Now he's freelance. He does stuff for New York Times and stuff like that. Uh, and he introduced me to Bilga, and we became buddies. And, you know, it was always a pleasure to see him at a function or a screening or whatever. And that was when you were East Coast, when you were in New York. When I was in New York, yeah. Like, when I saw him, I, I literally had not seen him in, like, a, a few years. I think the last time I saw him was at a screening for, like, Boss Baby in New York. <laughs> right. <laughs> when I was sort of going back and forth uh, when my wife was still in New York. So that's that's uh, that's a long time. But I, I just, I love him, and I really treasure our friendship. So it was really great to have him on the show. He's just the best. Yeah. And I can't emphasize enough to go seek out things that he's written because he's such a, a a great writer and and it's it's absolutely worth reading some of his reviews and following him on social media etc yeah anything he writes is uh, a treasure so yeah we can't wait to read his mission impossible piece it hasn't come out yet when we're recording but it should be out now so we'll share that across all of our social media platforms and show notes and everything else yep and uh i wanted to just quickly bring up something one of our Patreon followers pointed out uh, that uh, we never talk about your other podcast, Fine Tuning. Yeah. And uh, this, I can't remember who it was, but this person pointed it out and said that we should talk about it more because they love that show too. I think that's how they came across this show. They found out about it from that one. One of our favorite Patreon members, I mean, they're all our favorite, all 100 of them. We have 100 Patreon subscribers. That's great. But we could use 100 more. So again... If you're looking to, to subscribe, go ahead and do that. But Sonia from Austin, she first heard about the show on Light the Fuse because at the end of every episode, I kind of plug Light the Fuse and talk about what we've got going on. So usually I'm a little bit looser lipped on that. So if you want to know maybe what's coming up further in, in this show, listen to Light the Fuse until the very end or listen to the end of Fine Tuning to get Right, to find out what oh, right, they get yeah. sneak peeks. Oh, you give them the... yeah. Wow. Okay. I get a little looser, you know what I mean. I feel a little frisky. <laughs> well, because I, you know, obviously I feel like no one, no one listens to either show I'm on. So I, I, that's my mentality. Um, so it's always a, su- a wonderful surprise. No, they do. They Drew, and I think Drew is. Uh, if if you have any in- outside of Mission Impossible, if you have interest in animation at all, yes, that's why you've got to listen to Fine Tuning. That's why you've got to follow Drew on social media because that's what he does. Other than also post a lot of Michael Graves stuff on Instagram. I do. I do. Um, yes, I always I love animation. I wrote the Onward book. I've got a, I've got some fun Pixar stuff coming up that we can't talk about yet. Charles knows about. And yeah, it's it's a fun show. If you want to hear about animation, go there. Yeah. Once Great. a week. Cool. Yeah, okay. The only other thing I wanted to bring up, too, was just that uh, a reminder. We've got Brian De Palma coming up in June. No big deal. <laughs> just going to throw that out there. Yeah, that is a great one. I feel like I feel like it lives up to yeah everything we wanted it to be. Yeah. We got it. He was cranky. He was, <laughs> but he, then he kind of warmed up and he was very forthcoming. And uh, we both loved his novel so much. And we get a preview actually of his next novel, which is really cool. Yes. Yeah, it's great. It's great. Yeah. It, it, it's what you want, I think, out of this conversation. Uh, yeah. So of course that's a must listen. We've got other episodes coming up before that that are great too. We're talking to actually JJ's assistant who, during the time of Mission Impossible Three and Star Trek, and so that's a really fun chat. We're talking to uh, this underwater cinematographer who did he did three, four, five, and six right for Mission. I don't. Yeah. Pete, yes, he did. Yeah, he did. Pete Romano. I mean, he think he's credited as underwater DP for Ghost Protocol, Rogue Nation, and Fallout. But he revealed in the interview that he also did some underwater camera work for Mission Impossible 3, but it just didn't get credited for whatever reason. And could be back for one of the sequels. Could be. I'll leave that as a little tease <laughs> there. Yeah. <laughs> Pete was actually amazing. Yeah. And has an amazing career. And um, those of you who are following our our color of night coverage too you're gonna get some details <laughs> about some if you know about color of night you know that the pool is a big part of that movie so yes. 
get ready. You know that Drew did not pass up an opportunity to ask him about it. We almost forgot. I mean, I think it was at the very end yes. of the, the chat. Um, so, yeah, we had to throw that in there. But yeah. he's amazing. He's had an amazing career. And he was a really huge thrill to talk to. Yeah. So, yeah, we got some kick-ass apps coming up. Yes, we do. But without further ado, you should do your uh, favorite part of the show. Okay, here we go. Uh, this episode is brought to you by Jeremy Dillon and his amazing podcast, My Favorite Album. Each week, uh, Jeremy Dillon interviews a different musician, songwriter, actor, or filmmaker about the music they love and how it's influenced them and their work. And I think Charles and myself can both say that you should also follow him on social media because he is just the sharpest dressed man in the world. Yes. He was at some event recently and he had this amazing suit on and we had to text him immediately. I don't know what the time difference is between here and Australia, but... <laughs> Our sentiments were were beamed across the globe. <laughs> this episode is also brought to you by John B. and Real Estate Interest LLC, commercial real estate advice for growing companies. He just wants people to know that companies can consult with them even if they are not looking to buy or sell. Real Estate Interest LLC helps companies save and strategize too. So we will be back after this more or less legally... Shaky. Shaky. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> version of the plot theme by Kevin Blumenfeld. Um, so enjoy. I would love McCory and Cruz to make other movies together because I think they're so great. And I love the first Jack Reacher. I don't know how you feel about Jack Reacher. You know, it's funny. I um, I love the first half of the first Jack Reacher. Okay. I was not crazy about the way it ended. Um, and I was not crazy about Werner Herzog's character. Like he didn't strike me as, as menacing as sort of like the film was setting him up to be. But so here's the thing. At the time, I didn't know anything about Jack Reacher. I mean, I knew that, you know, there were hit novels. And but and I knew, like, from talking to friends who read them and, and family members who read them, that Tom Cruise was completely wrong for Jack Reacher. And I and I saw, uh, you know, this, the second one, which I didn't think was very good. But in the meantime, I became obsessed with Jack Reacher novels. And I, like, started <laughs> reading Jack Reacher novels. And, like, I love Jack Reacher novels now. And it's so funny because, I mean, he is so clearly, like, totally wrong for that part i mean it's just if there is a if there is a character out of literature who is described very specifically to not be tom cruise it's jack reacher right um like he's like this giant blonde guy with hands the size of turkeys um and but in my mind when i read jack reacher novels even though like they i'm i'm seeing tom cruise <laughs> like i'm just seeing like a really big <laughs> big powerfully built version of Tom Cruise which is which is ridiculous but that's kind of that's kind of where I'm at so now of course the thing about the Jack Reacher like the first one I was you know I, I was mixed on loved the first half didn't love the second half didn't like the second one but I was like I, I'd be totally fine with Tom Cruise continuing to make these movies but yeah. of course it's not how it works yeah. um so when you saw Fallout um I, th I believe this is probably a tweet that you sent immediately after seeing the movie this was your quote. You said Mission Impossible Fallout, period. This movie is sex, period. Which then you carried over and then a couple weeks later did your article and the, the headline for your review is just Mission Impossible Fallout is sex. I just <laughs> wanted to commend you on this because I think it's uh, amazing. <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I thought there was something weirdly sexy about that movie. Um, like, I mean, quite aside from just like the, the immense joy it brought me, um, there was just, I don't know, like just everything about it just, and I think I even hinted at this in my review, but not, not like, not like gross sex kind of thing, but like, just, just like, there was just a passion in that movie that I thought was really well done. Um, and even like some weird innuendo uh, in some of the dialogue. I mean, I just think it's a, you know, it's, it's, I don't know. It's it's like that was not that was not a that was not a, a line I just like pulled out of my butt. Like 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 there like there was something like just that like the that the word sex just kind of like was just like blaring in my head as I was watching that movie. 
<laughs> well, in the way you describe the bodies, you know, vertical, horizontal, and all these in all these different ways, it, it's you, you say it much more eloquently than I am now. But it's you, you explain it well in the review. You also, I love this. You find a way to to compare it to uh, Whit Stillman's Love and Friendship, which is an underrated movie that I absolutely love. I can't believe that you find a way to compare Mission Impossible Fallout to Love and Friendship. I thought that was great. I, I have not read this review in a while. Uh, <laughs> what, what did I say? <laughs> well, it was the way that you talked about the 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 exposition dump at the beginning of the movie with the message uh, that arrives, you know, there's, there's a very emotional scene to set up the emotional stakes. And then there's, you know, the, the exposition of the, which is so the, the old show, the way that uh, Bruce Geller talked about it with the, the old TV series was they got to skip an act because they didn't have to set up all this story with, you know, through an act of all these different scenes. They just threw all the information at you. And it was this great way to just get the story started. And that's kind of also what the movies have been able to do as well. And so you compared that with the very opening of uh, Love and Friendship with the way Whit Stillman like throws all these characters and, and information up at you and he just like dares you to try to keep up. Well, I think, yeah. And I think what happens there is, I mean, what happens in Love and Friendship is he throws all that stuff at us. And the point isn't that we need to understand everything that he's saying. It's that the totality of everything he's throwing at us is giving us a sense of this world. Right. He's just all these, you know, all these family connections and, and these things that he's throwing at us. You get the sense, oh, my God, this is like this incredibly rigid class world. Right. Where everybody has these, you know, connections and everybody has these like roles that they play in society. So, you know, you, like you're trying to keep up, but you're also part of it is that. You don't need to keep up like the, the story is going to the story is going to make sense it's going to make emotional sense i mean yeah. it's actually you know i mean christopher nolan's tenet is a bit like that where there is a certain point at which you're kind of like i'm not exactly sure what's going on but i know that the film knows kind of where i'm at and the film knows what to do with me it's not a case where like it's way ahead of me and i've lost the thread or i'm way ahead of it and i already know what's going to happen and it's now boring and cliche it's kind of like like you feel like it's like you it's a kind of loss of control, um, which I think, you know, cinema sh should aspire to. Like I, the, a, a, a viewer should never feel like they're in control of a movie, which is why I, I'm a big believer in movies in movie theaters. Right. Because it, the movie should be bigger than you. Right. Like that's the appeal of a movie more than any other art form. Right. More than TV, more than novels like you lose yourself in a movie. Um and I love it when movies can do that. And I love it when different, you know, genres can do that. And I love it when something like Mission Impossible, which does hinge on like, you kind of need to understand point A to point B to point C. That's my, my cat is about to make an appearance. I don't know if you can hear her. Um, but uh, but uh, yeah, no, that that is not a small child I have trapped in my basement. My um, but yeah, and I think that, yeah, I, thought, I mean, I thought Fallout did a nice job with that. And I mean, there were certain points in that film where I felt a little lost, but never lost in an unpleasant way. Like there was a kind of disorientation that you're like you're losing yourself in the movie in, in, a, in a way that that actually enhances your experience of watching the movie, which I think happens, you know, like one was like that, too. Right there. I mean, I know you guys have talked about this, how, you know, some people were confused by one. Yeah. Which. You know, I, I was never confused by one. And I think, but I think the confusion with one was there were certain scenes, like certain nuances of the plot that people didn't quite understand. Like the the, the deal between Max uh, and Phelps, I don't think people entirely understood. But, you know, the film was, the filmmaking was so confident that it didn't matter, right? There were certain things that you didn't quite understand, but the film was, the film was just moving along and, and it didn't matter because it, it knew exactly how to carry you from, scene to scene to scene to scene i mean the palma's like that too like that's the thing i mean there are certain De palma films where you know you don't exactly know what's happening but what's happening on screen is just so beautiful and so gripping that you're just you know you you're just pulled along do you think rogue nation is particularly confusing because i can't make heads or tails of that movie still to this day having seen it a hundred times <laughs> rogue nation um uh, yeah, I mean, I think I think that was actually my one problem with Rogue Nation. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> I, I like Rogue Nation. I don't, I, I you know, I, I like it a lot. But but there were certain parts of it where I didn't, 
you know, and I actually, as much as I love the uh, opera sequence, um, I, I, I didn't entirely uh, understand what exactly was happening in there. <laughs> um, but yeah, you know, I mean, I, I watched. It's so funny because because that's a film. I mean, I've watched. I, I've watched ex- except for two and three. I've watched you know all the others multiple times. So it's kind of sometimes hard to remember what what my initial reaction was. I mean, Rogue Nation. I was I was I was fully on board. But you know, yeah, there were parts where I was was kind of confused but it didn't matter you know because the, th- that one more than any of them i think is very much sequence you know sequence 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 right everything is like once you're in the sequence and 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 he's you know doing whatever he's doing you're with it right you're right so it doesn't really like the connective tissue between them doesn't matter as much because there's less of it right you're right. just kind of jumping from one to the other um and i think that's you know that's that's one way of doing these i my my you know my favorite anecdote is like when howard hawks made the big sleep and there, there was some element of the story i mean the big sleep if i don't know if you guys have seen it or you remember it but you know yeah. it's incomprehensible like right. individual <laughs> scenes are wonderful it's one of the greatest movies ever made you have no freaking idea what's happening in that movie <laughs> but it's like very much on purpose and and you know there was some element of like the solution to the plot that howard hawks wasn't clear on so he called the author of the novel right and was like wait wait if you know who did this and then you know the author explained he said but but if that if that person did that then how could x do y like i'm i'm not explaining it very well but the author was like well then i don't know either like it's just they just they <laughs> you know yeah it's kind of like it's it's just like whatever gets you through the night you know like as long as you you are carried along and you're entertained we're good yeah as long as as long as your enjoyment of individual scenes or the the movie does not hinge on your understanding of this particular plot point we're good you know right so i have i have good news thanks to twitter I, we can enter a time machine and go back to august 1st 2015 which i assume is right after you saw mission impossible rogue nation i can tell you exactly what you thought you said <laughs> what, what, what did i say oh my you god said, so mission impossible rogue nation is fun sexy cool but still only like the fourth best mission impossible movie <laughs> so it sounds like at the time you had it below three wow okay yeah, yeah. um Interesting. Yeah, I would not probably say that now. I mean, I've, I've revisited that a bunch of times. I'm trying to remember what my initial reactions were to three, like, which I, I remember enjoying. And I remember, I mean, you know, like, you know, Philip Seymour Hoffman was great. I mean, there were so many things about it that were that, that were terrific. Um, I don't remember, though, like, it wasn't like memorable in that way where, you know, I, I can kind of remember my initial reaction to it. Uh, and I, you know, haven't felt a ton of you know an overwhelming need to 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 rewatch it but yeah you know rogue nation i went back to multiple times like i saw it a couple of times in theaters and then you know when like the award screener came i you know totally watched that multiple times so yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah the top four i think drew and i feel the same way they're like uh, the top four in the series which is one four five and six like we've they're just on another level like i mean there are things that, that are that we love about three and things that we love about even two but those those top four are just on another level and, and i i do feel like i i need to give two and three another shot um i mean two like, like we talked about it, there's too much invo- talent great talent involved in two to really dismiss it you know and and part of it also might be that yeah, it was an interesting time in Cruz's career, right? Um, you know, like there, you you were really feeling, um, you know, the tension between what Cruz could be as an actor and his desire to become more of an action star, and you know, maybe that colored my thoughts of, you know, thoughts of two because also um, it, two is two is a uh, post post eyes wide shut right yes he yeah. had gotten he had gotten out of kubrick maximum security prison and was <laughs> decided to just let his locks yeah, fly just just go out yeah. to australia shoot some guns with john woo yeah because also there was i mean and it's a thing that you've probably noticed as well with a lot of stars like you know when when things start to not go well for them they go back to like they'll do a sequel right I mean, you know, Will Smith has done that, uh, you know, like when things start to sort of go south, they'll, you know, they'll just pop in a sequel. So I think maybe at the time Mission Impossible 2 might have also felt like Cruz going back to the safety of of something, even though it wasn't a sure thing, like going back to the safety of like a sure thing after sort of taking some artistic risks that 
I mean, I think artistically paid off really well, but didn't necessarily pay off in terms of star power or, um, you know, or financial success. I mean, Eyes Wide Shut at the time was, a, was a, I mean, was a disaster um, as much as I loved it. Uh, and some others loved it. You know, I mean, it was a, it was a flop. Like you, you got into arguments with people about it on the street. Um, <laughs> no, I'm not even kidding. <laughs> you know, people would like stop you and tell you about how much they hated Eyes Wide Shut. <laughs> And it's funny now that it's like considered such a, you know, such a classic, but, but like, I remember, I remember a bus ride with a bunch of people. I was at my job um, and we went on a retreat. I was, I was working for this magazine that, that isn't around at the time, but we actually went on a retreat to Hawaii of all places. And uh, we, I, I like, I was in the bus going from the airport or to the airport, or like we're, we're on the bus going somewhere. And we're a bunch of people and um, and somebody, like the person I was sitting next to brought up Eyes Wide Shut. And I was like, oh, yeah, Eyes Wide Shut, I love that movie. He's like, you liked Eyes Wide Shut? And we kind of got into this argument. And then he got up and he's like, hey, this guy likes Eyes Wide Shut. And like the entire <laughs> bus, like I'm not even joking, the entire bus like turned around and started laughing. <laughs> like that's how much wow. people hated Eyes Wide Shut. <laughs> <laughs> so, so like the idea of Cruz, like, you know, going back to making like a big stunt driven action movie uh, after that, you know, that probably colored my opinion of it to a certain extent as well. You know, well, Charles, it sounds like we're getting down to the big question. Do you have any more observations you want to share? Any um, any embarrassing tweets you want to bring up? That Phil has <laughs> I've run out. I've Up run... until recently, I was planning on deleting all my tweets uh, before 2016. So you, you oh, know. we oh, wow. got it in so the nick of time. Of, just in time. Yeah. I've run out of embarrassing tweets, but I I just want to just... I've, I've, I've messaged you a couple times about your Terrence Malick um, writings that you've done, reviews and things. I just, I love the work you've done about Terrence Malick. I don't really have a question. I'm, I'm looking for a question here to ask you something about Terrence Malick. What do you think of, uh, if Terrence Malick did a Mission Impossible movie, what would that look like? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> wow. Um, yeah. I mean, you want to, you, you, you want to talk about a director getting his teeth kicked in. Uh, <laughs> see, that would happen. But I will say, Thin Red Line proved to me that Terrence Malick, if he wanted to, could probably direct a kick-ass action movie. Not that he ever would. Yeah. But um, and and some scenes in New World as well. Yeah, I was gonna say. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, he's not. You know, I mean, he knows what he's doing. He's just he's just doing a different thing and is increasingly doing a different thing. But I will say, um, you know, the the thing that I was telling you about, um about Eyes Wide Shut and about how like people would stop you on the street to tell you how much they hated it. I mean, that happened with The New World uh, and and also to a certain extent with I mean, Thin Red Line. Thin Red Line was, you know, it was nominated for Oscars and, you know, acclaimed by a, a certain group of people, but it was very divisive. And um, it's just so funny because obviously uh, Malik's, well, Hidden Life was, was mostly well-liked, but the three before that, obviously weren't as well liked um and people you know when people when i hear people say oh you know if only he would go back to making movies like the new world which i love i love the new world but but i'm like do you remember what it was like when the new world came out <laughs> because people were very unhappy um so uh so you know time time changes a lot of things um like with, you know, I mean mission impossible is kind of one of those as well and yeah. the question is you know i mean i, I i've said you know, like I said earlier, um, Cruz, I think, kind of read the market and read where it was going and, and I think did something very smart with that. But you do also wonder how much of it, our fondness for it is that things kind of came back around and that we are, you know, we're maybe it's not just that they have played their cards well and made great movies, which they have, but maybe we as just viewers are more receptive to something like that today than we might've been, you know, however many years ago. I feel the same way about the John Wick movies. Like if John Wick was released in 2001, what would we have thought? I don't know. I'd like to think we would have still loved it, but at the time we might've just said, what the hell is this? this is just the guy blowing people's heads off. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we did a whole mini series on John Wick, Bill, so you have to listen to that now. I saw, no, I saw yes. that you did. I, have, I haven't listened to those yet, but um, uh, it seems like a very good idea to, go from Mission Impossible to John Wick. Yes. Because well, they do share certain, you know. Yeah. We thought there was enough crossover that it wouldn't offend too many people. But I think I think the three of us are the biggest voyage of time 
uh, fanatics on the planet. Yeah. Charles and I went to two separate versions. You, you, do you have any information on where we're at? I, I'm assuming you've probably already written the booklet for the Criterion release. Um, no, although I do know, I know a guy who was writing a book on the Voyage of Time with with the assistance of Terrence Malick. So, um, oh, okay. so I'm looking forward to that book whenever it comes out. Um, no, I mean, I don't, you know, the thing I had heard was that he's working on a new cut. Another cut. So this would be the fourth cut. Another cut. This would yeah. be the fourth cut. Because yeah. there's the one with Kate Blanchett narrating. There's one with, is Pitt. it Brad Pitt narrating? Brad Pitt. And then there was one that had no narration. I think the one that's the one that we that Drew and I saw in theaters that was three point six aspect ratio. So I've never seen that one. Yeah, we oh. saw that one in theaters. It was pretty cool. Yeah, it is my understanding that he wants to create basically a ver. I believe it's a version of that one, but with new music, and probably, I mean, probably, you know, some changes visually as well. So I get the sense that he's not quite done. You know, it's. I remember when the Brad Pitt one was, which was like 45 minutes long, you know, they screened that for us in IMAX and I reviewed it. And I remember like my assumption was, oh, this is going to come out in IMAX and it's going to be like a thing in IMAX. And then like, I don't know if the damn thing ever, I mean, I think it came out, but I think it came out for like a week or something like that. Yeah. Because before I knew it, it was gone. Yeah. We saw it at the, we saw that. Is that the version we saw at the California science center? Drew? Yeah. Yeah. So we saw that one too. At, in, in, at in a museum, yeah, 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 and I thought I thought that was really well done. And at the time, I hadn't seen the Kate Blanchett one that had premiered at Venice and Toronto and had gotten like savage reviews. But like people liked the Brad Pitt, they hated the Kate Blanchett one. And then I remember there was some publicist who actually had like a DCP of that one like lying around at Magno one day, and they were like, "Hey, do you want to watch it?" And I was like, "Oh yeah, sure, of course." And I watched it, and I was like, "Oh yeah, this is great." The, the like. Why the hell do people hate this? This is wonderful. And like that one has never actually been released properly, right? Yeah, no. no there's no version that's been released properly. There, I think there's one overseas maybe that was yeah, released. Yeah, because I have a, I have a Blu-ray of the, the, the Kate Blanchett one that is like, you know, was, was like in Italy or something like that. And then, um, you know, they did, a, they did a live orchestral version of that here that's right in, in which i um but it wasn't keith blanchett reading um it was oh god I, I can't remember the actress's name um there was another narration it was the same oh. narration but it was read by someone else oh, it was like read live by somebody yeah yeah i want to say like lily oh, okay. james or somebody um but um and um and that was uh, absolutely wonderful so you know i mean and i i'm sure he has some you know he probably wants to do another version of you know the tree of life i mean it's all like this thing just never ends for him um <laughs> but yeah i wouldn't be surprised if he if he if he's still fun. i mean i think he's kind of fiddling with all of these he's like was... michael mann but but not quite like because he can kind of work with like a small crew of of editors in austin i think they can just kind of just keep going charles and i are still dying to see the black hat director's cut i miss it every time it's on fx you know so oh yeah i know you're a big champion of that well, well, we can talk after the podcast. I'm okay. able to help you out. Okay. okay. <laughs> um, all right. Well, I think it's time, Charles. Should we? Well, first of all, you you haven't ever ranked Tom Cruise's hairstyles online, so we would love to hear your thoughts on that. You know, I mean, the, I'm glad I haven't ranked his hairstyles because I have a very a changing relationship to his hairstyles. I remember the. <laughs> I mean that the the like the mop thing that he had going on in two I thought was just ridiculous at the time, you know the long haired Tom Cruise of that era, like the Vanilla Sky era. I just I I, I was not down with that at all, um, <laughs> and I don't know what I would think about it now. Um, I do remember when I first saw like the first stills from Eyes Wide Shut, I was like, what the hell is going on with his hair? Like, is this, is this like <laughs> taking place in the early 70s or something? Like, it just seemed like such a weird. And of course, now it's like, yeah, sure, whatever. That's his hair. I, I don't care. Um, you know, I don't know. I think I think Tom Cruise, I think my, you know, the color of money, Tom Cruise is 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 very much, you know, I think the the. The hairstyle I most relate to. Um, What's your favorite in the Mission series, though? Does that mean that Mission One? That's pretty similar to Color of Night, right? Um, Color of Money. Yeah, uh, yeah. Sorry, yeah. Color of Money. Yeah, um, sorry. 
Color of Night, another complete, another movie. You should do a podcast. We've talked a lot about Color of Night on this podcast because we've found a lot of collaborators that have worked on Color of Night. So we always try to get a Color of Night question in. This is actually true. Yeah. <laughs> we talked to Leslie Ann Warren about it and uh, the sound editor and upcoming uh, someone who did the underwater photography. <laughs> yeah, he shot Bruce Willis's penis. Yeah, so. There you go. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh yeah no i remember uh, color of color of night vividly um <laughs> i was, a, I was a, a big jane march fan back in the day um i'm sure you were so yeah i think i think the the haircut in the first one is probably um probably the best you know it's it is i remember at the time i think that felt like kind of a new hairstyle for him yeah because it was a little buzz cutty um and uh and you know this was post uh vampire you know, post Lestat, which, you know, Lestat is just, I mean, that's just a ridiculous <laughs> style for him. <laughs> so, yeah, I think, I think of the, of these, I think the, the first one is probably, uh, probably the one um, that I would gravitate towards. Okay. Based on the set photo, seven and eight look pretty close. They're, it's pretty short. So I think you'll, I hope, I hope that'll, we'll be, we'll be going back to, uh, to a short do. That picture of him on the motorcycle, just kind of with his, like, with his, beak sticking out it's just uh. <laughs> <laughs> um charles found your rankings from was this 2017 charles yeah you ranked all the tom cruise movies i think just his entire career and so we gleaned an early rankings of yours that was pre-fallout yeah was it pre-rogue nation as well or was no no rogue nation is on the list so we have a I don't know if you want us to tell you or if you should you should just give us your rankings probably. Uh, let me give you my ranking. It probably won't match that because I, I don't remember what that what that ranking was. I mean, you know, these things change. Um though I will say that was a fun ranking to do because they gave it was for Rolling Stone and they gave me a lot of time to do it and I actually did go back and rewatch almost all of the films. Um not just the I mean, we watched almost all the Tom Cruise films and it was that actually that like several months of just like rewatching his films um gave me a newfound appreciation for him that said uh if i had to rank them now i would be you know one would be one i think fallout would be number two uh ghost protocol uh would be three so far that 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 matches that matches ours okay and then rogue nation and then um then you know three two wow so you have the exact that's exactly our same ranking Okay. But 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 it is slightly different from what you had in 2017. <laughs> what did I have? So in 2017 you had one as number one. Okay. Uh, Fallout was not out yet, but you had Ghost Protocol next. Okay. Then you had three. See. Then you had Rogue Nation, and then you had two. So Rogue Nation has 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 grown over time for you. This is telling me I really need to rewatch three, because Rogue Nation has definitely grown over time. But I think like three has maybe fallen over time possibly unfairly um you know and it's possible i just like that movie more than i (laughs) more than i think i do (laughs) here's a proposal you watch two and three and you come back for like a 15 minute episode or something you can tell us okay (laughs) Okay. also was that was that um was that uh list it was 2017 i believe it was 2017 from rolling stone and i think mission impossible ended up sixth in the entirety of Tom Cruise's filmography. Makes sense. Was was um was was that the year of Rogue Nation? It was the year of the Mummy. It was the year of the Mummy? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I wonder though is 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 if that was an updated list. I'm trying to remember if that might have been an updated list, um, but I'm not sure. Like because oh, you know you do these and then like a couple of years later they're like, hey, there's a new Tom Cruise. You want to re-rank and you know right. update it? It's possible it was. Um, because I'm trying to remember if you know if it was pegged to Rogue Nation, but no, it would have been pegged to the. Oh. All it says here at the top of the article is October second, twenty seventeen. Huh. Okay. Happens. Um. Yeah, the Mummy. <laughs> that would have been a. Imagine but... if the Mummy had been good. Listen, everybody was trying to make the Mummy good, but. It just didn't happen. You ranked the mummy thirty nine out of forty, <laughs> <laughs> and forty was endless love. Endless love, yeah. Well, wow. which he's like walks by, basically. Yeah. You know, recently I had to interview Francis Ford Coppola, and I rewatched The Outsiders, and it is it is funny. I think I even said this to Coppola. And, you know, it's funny. Like you watch The Outsiders, and Tom Cruise is like the ugly one, <laughs> like of all those actors, <laughs> he's like the ugly one. Um, 
like the, 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 the teeth are all messed up and he's kind of scrawny. It's just funny. Um, you know, how, how times change. Bilga, we could talk to you all night. Um, it is like 1230 AM where you are right now. Um, thank you so much for doing this. Come on the show anytime. We love your insight and, yeah, everyone should follow you on Twitter, obviously, if they don't already. They're fools. Um, but what do you have anything else you you want to plug? Oh, nothing to plug. Uh, but, uh, you know, I've, I've enjoyed uh, catching up with the podcast. Uh, I think I'm impressed with your ability to come up with new stuff to talk about, um, about these <laughs> movies. And uh... there, well, there, there are so many amazing people who have worked on these movies, and I feel like they don't get the credit they deserve uh, from cinematographers to editors, production designers, costume designers, all these people who should be talked to more often. And so we're, we're happy to talk to them. And there's so many amazingly gracious and, and talented people to talk to. It does seem like a, a, the kind of um, franchise that really is about like the crew. I mean, I guess it makes sense given the type of, you know, given what Mission Impossible is about, but like, it does seem like, you know, it is always interesting, you know, the composers, the editors, the cinema, like it's like, there's just a, you know, I mean, there's they're such constructed movies that like the people that are actually like making it happen feel very important to these movies in a way that maybe they don't in other franchises. Obviously they're always important, but like this, these, these films do seem like they kind of foreground uh, those folks to a certain degree. Yeah. Well said. Agreed. Bilga. So great seeing your beautiful face. Such a pleasure to talk to you. Yeah, yeah. This I is great. Love reading your work. I've loved reading it for years. And Drew has always talked about how he's known you. So it's great to actually have a conversation with you. Yeah. Come out to LA. I will. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll come out one of these days. Yes. When it's safe. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we would love to see you. But, but again, thank you so much for coming on. And we'll, we'll talk soon. Definitely. Bilga in the books. I hope he comes back to talk about Seven after he reviews it. Hopefully he reviews it, and hopefully we'll have him back on afterwards. Yes, oh, that would be lovely. It's what happens when you're if you're at a publication like he's at New York Magazine and Vulture, right? Yeah, and there are multiple critics. Do they like fight to get the movie they really want to review? I think at least how it looks like on on Vulture is it looks like people have beats, and I would say his beat is definitely the kind of like action genre kind of space right so i think it's a sure bet and i'm sure he would fight everybody else to the death <laughs> not that he two wonderful women who who are his are also critics angela and allison uh yeah they i'm sure they'll just let him take over for that one just because his passion is so strong but right. yeah we will get him back yeah i'd love to have him back it was so great to to finally talk with him I, I've, I've dm'd him a couple of times on on twitter just about terrence malick stuff just because he's such a obviously we talk we talked today about Terrence Malick a lot. So yeah, uh, but and he's always been so nice to respond to me, even though he had no idea who I was other than like, he's like, what, you know, Drew? Okay, sure. I'll talk to you, I guess. <laughs> but he's the best. <laughs> yes, he's just so nice and, 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 and awesome. So it was so it was such a pleasure to have him on the show. And uh, yeah, hope we have him back. Was there anything that we talked about that we should bring up? Well, I mean, I, he, he really lit my brain on fire talking about yet another version of Voyage of Time. Oh, yeah. Which God. is the movie that you and I have seen more theatrically um, aside of from Mission Impossible that we try to go see as much as, <laughs> as we can. Someone's got to release all the versions or at least just one version so that we can watch it on, on home video. Yeah. Which one did you like more? Well, I thought that the 3.6 super ultra widescreen version was pretty interesting. And I thought it was kind of nice to not have any narration and just let it live on its own. Yeah. Uh, so I, I, I liked that version probably better. Okay. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I appreciated both of them. Uh, what about you? Yeah. I think I remember the other one more just because we were at the Science Center. It was, you know, it was a pretty cool imax -y screen. I don't know if it's technically IMAX, but IMAX-ish screen. And the other one, we had to see it like the Century City Mall like the one showing it had at 1030 on a Sunday. And I remember being very stressed out about getting there and <laughs> the mall was under construction and oh God, but 
Yeah. Yeah, I liked them both. I can't wait to see this this new one. And the the other version that we haven't seen with the Brad Pitt narration. Yeah. So uh I, I also loved all of Bilga's thoughts on on Fallout, and uh, you should definitely check out his review of the movie. We'll link that in our show notes. And uh he needs to revisit three, and I'm curious to have him, you know, give us his updated rankings once he does that. Yeah. And two. He needs to revisit two, it sounds yeah, like too. Yeah. But uh I think we should tell everyone to go to our Patreon, patreon.com slash light the fuse, sign up, uh, get bonus content. We do weekly episodes on there for all of our Patreon subscribers who are at the bonus content level. And um, we recently did an episode about the Jack Ryan cinematic. We called it multiverse because it's not just one universe. And I realized we forgot some, another connection to mission impossible in there too. It was uh, go ahead. our very own Keith Campbell who came on the show was the stunt double for Tom Cruise and mission one and mission two. If you haven't listened to those episodes, you absolutely should go back and listen to him. He is a great interview, but he is in Patriot games. Oh, who is he? He's like a pretty prominent, like thug guy who comes up and tries to attack Jack Ryan and they like fight in the street. I was just, when we were watching, when I was watching a few weeks ago, I was like, Oh my God, it's Keith Campbell. (laughs) Is he the guy who gets killed on the army base? Is it an army base? I can't remember, but it's like in a street. It's on a street. And the guy is like, I think he's pretending to be a jogger. Yeah, he's in a sweatsuit. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And that, that That is Keith Campbell in the sweatsuit. Yeah, he gets shot a bunch of times. It's very cool. Yeah. So anyway, I thought that was fun. I, I, we didn't talk about it in the episode. I wanted to bring it up here, but also tell people to sign up because there's so many great. That's a mega episode, too. That's like a we did like almost an hour talking about the Jack Ryan. And uh, and the, also without remorse is the new Tom Clancy movie with Michael B. Jordan playing the John Clark character. Yeah, we've got a bunch of good Patreon ones I'm excited about and some I'm less excited about, but we'll still probably be end up being pretty good. So definitely <laughs> check out our Patreon. What else, Charles? What else should people be doing? Uh, they should follow us on social media at Light the Fuse Pod on Twitter and Instagram. They should go to our T Public page, which is linked from our website, lightthefusepodcast.com. In the merch section, you can buy a shirt or a mask or a tote bag or a laptop bag or a computer case or what a phone case all whatever all kinds of stuff get stuff that can uh you know advertise people spread the word of mouth about our show and we get a couple bucks out of that too that helps uh helps us put the show together every week uh, i also want to give a special thank you to jacob from holland jacob has been with us for so long we love him so much uh thank you jacob for all your help uh and uh also a big thank you to our editor and mixer luke burson to our production assistant, Abby Smith, and to our intern, Adam Bumas. Thank you guys for making everything possible. And thank you, of course, to Kevin Blumenfeld for his legally shaky music. And uh, I guess that's about it. We've got to come back next week. We've got great episodes coming up, so come on back. Thanks again for listening, everyone. Before we go, another mission, should you choose to accept it, please rate, review, and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. And remember that you can follow us on Twitter and Instagram at LightTheFusePod, and email us questions or comments at LightTheFusePodcast at gmail.com. This message will self-destruct in five seconds.